When we have our singing once a month on Sunday afternoon, we assemble with the younger people down here for the most part, but everybody joins in the singing. And we sing a song about the Old and the New Testament. Very simple little song. A lot said in it, especially by implication. Old and new, old and new. God's will of the Bible has two parts for you. Read it through, read it through. You learn from the old, and you're saved by the new. Well, I would like this morning for us to study from the Bible about the two great covenants, the Old and the New Testament, that God had with man. In the Old Testament, of course, there is revealed the first age in which God dealt with man, the patriarchal age or the father rule period lasting some 2,500 years, covered from Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, to the giving of the law of Moses, as far as the Jews are concerned, in Exodus chapters 19 and 20. Then, of course, there was the Jewish dispensation, some 1,500 years, where those Jews approached God under the authority of the law of Moses. And it continues down to Acts chapter 2 with the establishment of the Lord's church in Jerusalem on that first Pentecost day as it's set out in the law of Moses. And of course, the law, according to Colossians 2 and verse 14, was nailed to the cross. But they continued to abide by it, those Jews in Jerusalem, until the truth of the gospel was revealed. And you can see that in their conduct in that period between the cross and the first Pentecost when the church of our Lord was established. Then from that point forward, for a number of years, the gospel of the New Testament was being revealed by Christ through the agency of the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Godhead, via the apostles and New Testament prophets. The early church understood this because on... Uh, in, uh, Luke's writings in Acts chapter 2, he says that the church continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. For they were the ambassadors of the court of heaven. They had received the baptismal measure of the Holy Spirit. And via that power, Christ revealed to them through a period of years the truth that we have in the New Testament. Paul would say in 1 Corinthians 13, that came part and parcel as it was needed. That's how the New Testament came. It didn't just come all of the day of Pentecost as soon as the Lord established His church. But we're under the authority of Jesus Christ. We're not under Moses or anything under the patriarchal age. And thus Paul would write, Whatsoever you do in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks unto God the Father by Him. Colossians 3 and verse 17, I say. So in right division of the word, which is incumbent upon us, it's obligatory upon us that we might know the truth and be set free by it, John 8, 31 and 32, and John 17, 17, which Paul demands through the Spirit that we engage in the study of the Word of God, right and dividing it, 2 Timothy 2, 15. We must know the difference in the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. I suggest to you that when you read the book of Hebrews, you have tre tremendous instruction on the design and the purpose of the law of Moses, the Old Covenant. But we have some statements in the New, such as Galatians chapter 3 and verse 24, where Paul says, Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. And that word faith there, though in English the article doesn't appear before it, he is saying we're justified by the system of faith that is the New Testament system. And it involves then a personal faith of everyone who would become a Christian, which personal faith is created, sustained, and strengthened through one's reception of the truth. So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. So their faith, as it is in Jude verse 3, where we're to contend for the faith, it is used by grammarians and called a synecdoche, where a part stands for the whole, or the whole for its parts. So belief is such an important thing in serving God, then belief stands for the whole New Testament system. And that's the way it's used. But then we also find Paul saying to the Corinthians concerning the value of the Old Testament for us today, 
that these things, verse 6, 1 Corinthians 10, now these things were our examples to the intent we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. So it shows us that when you love the Lord, your faith is built upon His Word and sustained thereby, and the proof of it is rendering obedience to His will, then you have these negative examples of what happened to people under the law of Moses when they disobeyed Him. And uh, the Old Testament says don't do that. So we sing sometimes to young people about Nadab and Abihu and how that they are examples, but they're negative examples. And we're telling the children, don't do something without authority from God to do it, that authority today in the New Testament. So there are negative examples, there are positive examples. You love the Lord, you keep His commandments, He blesses you. If you say you love the Lord and have faith in Him, but you don't do what He said in the way He said it and for the reason He said it, then you're under curse. And that's a big general thing that comes out of the study of the Old Testament. But today I want to be more specific. Let us realize as we add to Galatians 3 and verse 24 and 1 Corinthians 10, and verse 6 is to the value of the Old Testament for Christians who are under the authority of Christ in the New Testament. And remember Matthew 28, 18, Jesus said, All authority hath been given unto me. Now where do you find that authority? Well, the Holy Spirit revealed it in the New Testament. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 as we've been studying it in the auditorium class on Sunday morning. But look with me then to how the Old Testament is said to be a figure of the true. In Hebrews 9 and verse 24, he says, For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands. Now that you would understand that to be the temple and preceding it the tabernacle. He says what they were. He says which are the figures of the truth. Right here a principle is established. And that is that in the law of Moses especially you would see figures or shadows or types that would be pointing to things in the New Testament of the Christ uh, that are the antitypes or the true. So he says, which are the figures of the true, but unto heaven itself. Well, then there is with the tabernacle, as the law taught it, a shadow or a figure of heaven itself. Now, pause here with me and we'll see this develop. But Christ is our high priest. And he didn't just offer blood as the high priest and the Levitical priesthood did, sprinkling it on the mercy seat once a year in the most holy place of the temple and before the, the tabernacle for his sins and the sins of the people. For Christ had no sin, thus he entered into the real most holy place of which the holy, most holy place in the uh, tabernacle was only a figure. And that's heaven itself. He could do that because he had no sin. He could die on behalf of everybody else and shed his blood for the remission of sins and thus his own sacrifice, his own body was offered, which we just commemorated in the Lord's Supper and the bread and the fruit of the vine. <clears throat> thus he entered into heaven itself and the real holy of holies, that the most holy place of the tabernacle and temple only was a figure. And thus he ever makes intercession for us and Paul declares to Timothy, he is the only mediator between God and man. That is, the man, Jesus Christ. So, for Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but unto heaven itself. So when I begin to read in the law of Moses, especially concerning the tabernacle, I know I'm not reading uh, that which is abiding. Now, the Jew had to learn this when you obeyed the gospel. And when you realize this is from the letter to the Hebrews, that's the Jews who were converted they knew about the law of Moses and his teaching about the Levitical priesthood and the chief priests and all that went along with the worship under the law of Moses of the Jew through the priests in the tabernacle and then the temple. But watch further. <clears throat> in Hebrews chapter 8, verses 1 and 2, the great writer says, We have such an high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle which the Lord pitched and not man. In our study just recently in uh, the auditorium class on Sunday morning, we noticed that Paul refers to the church as a temple, a place of worship. You see, therefore, the temple or the tabernacle was a figure of the church. 
And in that uh, church, there is the real over against the shadow that was taught of the law of Moses. So you see partly how that the law was a pedagogos, a tutor, a schoolmaster, to bring the Jews into Christ if they had right divided the law of Moses where they would recognize such a thing, and most of them didn't. But further... You see that the old, no matter how sincerely a Jew kept it, could never give a complete, clear conscience. Listen to the writer of Hebrews again. Hebrews chapter 9, verses 8 and 9. The Holy Ghost, this signifying, that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest. In other words, as long as the tabernacle and the Levitical priesthood and all that that uh, had to do with of the Jews worshiping God in that system, as long as it existed, then it was still pointing to something, the real, yet to come. So he says, while as the first tabernacle was yet standing, and that's how he concludes it, while it was standing and being used, and the Jews approached God through the law of Moses, then the real had not yet come. And then he tells us about it. That one temple, that tabernacle, which was a figure of, for the time then present, in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices, but look at these, that could not make him that did the service perfect, as pertaining to the conscience. It's very interesting that Peter, who very well knew this, as he was writing part of the New Testament of the Christ, in 1 Peter 3.21, says that the baptism doth also now save us. Not the putting away of the filth of the flesh. Watch it. But the answer of a good conscience toward God. How so? By the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So if there's been no actual resurrection of Christ from the dead, then Christ has not yet died. And it would take the flawless Lamb of God who was tempted in every point like as we are yet without sin, who could offer His own body a sacrifice for the benefit of man spiritually on the cross of Calvary. And on that cross shed His own blood for the remission of sins. And thus at the end of His suffering, as He willed Himself to die, having suffered to the uttermost, and paid the price for your sins and mine. He would say it is finished. Never could that be said. While the tabernacle and then the temple stood. And as the law of Moses was, was carried out according to the worship there. For these things were only figures. They were only shadows. They were teaching the Jews of what yet was to come. And, of course, these Jews who are Christians, due to temptation and persecution, are actually thinking about going back under the law and giving up the New Testament system. And, lo, here, inspiration says, you're going to give up the real for the shadow. You're going to give up the type or the anti-type for the type. Now, watch. In Hebrews 7, 18 and 19, look what the New Testament, the covenant of the Christ, does. For there is verily a disannulling of the commandment going before for the weakness and unprofitableness thereof. Now that's the law of Moses. Don't get us wrong. The law of Moses did exactly what God intended it to do. Paul said in the book of Romans it was to make sin exceeding sinful. Well, how do you do that? It made man aware of the fact that if you're going to be saved by a pure law system, you never will be saved. Because what's peculiar about a pure law system, the first time you violate one, no matter how small it is in your eyes, component part of it, the whole system condemns you, James says. And once that happens, if it's a pure law system, you see there can't be any mercy. There can't be any favor extended. So the whole thing made man aware of the fact, hey, you need a Savior. Where's that Savior going to come from? Can't come from among men for all of sin and fallen short of the glory of God. Romans 3.23, and the wages of sin is death. Well, then where must it come? Well, go back and read Isaiah chapter 53, written some 700 or so years before the Christ. And you'll see the suffering Savior described. Do you know also that the Jew who did some thinking based upon the truth but of the law of Moses, especially the Old Testament, they could not see, and Paul refers to this, how that God, being God, could deal with lost mankind. He's a just God. Justice, pure justice says destroy him. It's his fault. He sinned. 
How is it that there can be a Savior? God can't do it. Well, it must be. It must be that uh, since man can't either, it must be an angel that will do it. Have you ever noticed how the book of Hebrews starts and what it says about angels? It will make it very clear that Christ, not an angel, that is, He's not an angel. He was made above the angels in the sense of what He did. He wasn't created at all. He's God. But it would be one of the Godhead three who would come and be a man. That's what they didn't understand. That God would not just be God, as the writer of uh, Paul in Philippians said, he would uh, divest himself of the glories and the form of deity. And still being deity, take upon himself the form of a man. Jews couldn't understand that. And thus Paul talks about the mystery revealed in the gospel. They didn't have that figured out. They couldn't see God becoming a man. But the gospel revealed that he was. And that's why he would say to Timothy, as I quoted a moment ago, that Christ is the only mediator between God and man. And he says, the man, Jesus Christ. So, for there is verily or truly a disannulling of the commandment going before for the weakness and unprofitableness thereof. For the law made nothing perfect, but the bringing in of a better hope did, by the which we, we Christians, we members of the church, the spiritual temple, by the which we draw near or nigh to God. In other words, there's no way to be what God says you must be to be saved without what Christ did. Well, you say, yes, He died on the cross. He did that for us. We can never do it for ourselves. He suffered. He was flawless, though tempted in every point like as we are yet without sin. So He could be the Lamb of God and go to the cross and die on our behalf, shed His blood for the rest of our sins. But they fail to realize that that blood is the blood of the New Testament shed for the rest of our sins. Out of it, our Lord instituted the Lord's Supper, which the Passover itself pointed to the Lord's Supper. And thus, we're able to see then that when Jesus said, Matthew 16, 18, upon this rock, that is the truth that He's the Son of God, that Peter confessed, upon this rock I will build my church, and the church is the temple of God, then guess what was being pointed to in the death of Christ on the cross and the giving of His body a sacrifice for sin and the shedding of His blood for the remission of sins and the church that He would build to which He added every saved person from the time it started to the present and unto the end of the preaching of the gospel. Acts 2, 41, 42, and 47. And these are people that believe the gospel. They were under the true, not a figure, not a shadow, now listen in Hebrews 9, 18 through 20, concerning the blood of the animals offered in those sacrifices. Whereupon neither the first testament was dedicated without blood. You see, to be a figure, the Jew had to get it drilled into his mind as well as before the law of Moses system. He had to understand that when you sin, an innocent life must be given up. And it has to be best what you've got, the blue ribbon lamb that will win first place at the state fair. Not the one that's born with a crooked leg. And so you give that which costs you something. And the Lord, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world, for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. He gave His only begotten Son. Best heaven had, of which there's no bester. <laughs> that's what He did. So the best came, and we offer our best. But under that Levitical priesthood and the offerings that were made there, the turtle doves and pigeons and lambs and bullocks, and sometimes they said on the great feast days, as Josephus and others recorded it, that the temple had blood cascading down the steps. So many thousands upon thousands of animals were offered. Now you, you see what looked horrendous to a human uh, the Old Testament used the terminology saying that's a sweet-smelling savor to the Lord. For it forecasted the day when the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, would die upon the cross. And the sun wouldn't shine when the Maker died. And the earth he created quaked as he gave up the ghost. For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and of goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the testament which God hath enjoined unto you. 
all foreshadowing in a figure, the day the Lord died on Calvary's cross. But in Hebrews 9, 12, he goes on to let us know, further, neither by the blood of bulls and goats and calves, watch it, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Interesting that he says that. Earlier in Hebrews 5, in a passage familiar to most of us as Bible students, the scripture says of the Christ becoming a human and living as a human, that he uh, learned obedience by the things which he suffered. That doesn't mean he learned to obey God. It means he actually experienced being a man like you do, though he's God in the flesh. And thus he humbled himself and obeyed everything God expected him to do to save us. As he himself would say, my meat or my sustenance is to do the will of God. And thus he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. And there's the blood of Christ under the new, uh, that brought the New Testament into existence. It was shed for the remission of our sins, contrasted with the blood of all those animals. That was a shadow, the cause in the mind of the Jew. You can't save yourself. Even this law itself, though it cost an innocent life, the most humble among animals, doves, pigeons, lambs, and calves, the best they had, had to die for their sins. And yet, the thought of sin went forward. Now, keep in mind, those who lived under the law of Moses, faithful to that law, those who lived under patriarchy, of which there was no written law, who were faithful to that law, such as Abraham, Adam, Isaac, Jacob, so on, their faithfulness under that law allowed the blood shed at Calvary's cross to reach back and cover them, as well as coming forward 2,000 years in our belief and obedience to the gospel to remit our sins through faith in his name and compliance with his will. Listen in Hebrews 9.10 concerning the law of Moses which stood only in meats and drinks and divers washings and carnal ordinances imposed on them until the time of reformation. In other words, it never was meant to be permanent. The Jew couldn't get that in his mind. These who had obeyed the gospel had understood it, but even then they were having problems, or you wouldn't have the Hebrew letter written. But watch under the new, and now Peter who lived under both, and an apostle of Jesus Christ, 1 Peter 2, 5, he says to the church, and these were Jewish Christians, for he was the apostle of the Gentile, that is, as he originally wrote the letter to them, he says, ye also, as lively or living stones, are built up a spiritual house, now listen, and holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices. Now that's what we do. Our life is to be lived as the authority of Christ, manifest in the precepts and principles of the New Testament, are put into practice in our lives. And that's what Paul meant that Peter meant here in Romans 12, 1 and 2. That as you renew your mind by the knowledge of the Lord's mind in the word of the gospel, then you're presenting your bodies as living sacrifices, which is your reasonable service. Peter's simply echoing Paul, or one's echoing the other. Then notice under the law that the law was aimed at fleshly Israel. Remember, Israel was truly God's people, but it was a literal people out of all other nations. It was a civil nation, not just a spiritual nation. Thus the law of Moses had to serve not only as a spiritual law, but it also served as a civil law and a criminal law for an actual nation on this earth. And so notice it was aimed more at the flesh as it was that schoolmaster bringing them unto Christ. Notice Hebrews 9 and verse 13. For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of an heifer sprinkling the unclean, sanctified to the purifying of the flesh. And so that's why Paul will talk a lot about, such as in Romans, when he's refute, refuting error taught on the law, that he will point out, that it was meant to be on the fleshly plane for an actual nation. Oh, it was spiritual in that it came from God, did what God wanted to do. But listen, it never was meant to do what the gospel could do. You had to learn that to become a Christian. In 1 Peter 1 and verse 22, seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth. That's the gospel truth. There's the difference. It's aimed solely, that is the gospel, at the cleansing of your spirit. That's the reason a lot of the laws that pertain to dietary laws and all that kind of thing are removed in the gospel. 
Now notice too in Hebrews 7, 23 concerning the priest under the law of Moses. Speaking of them, and they truly were many priests because they were not suffered to continue by reason of death. In other words, they're humans. It is appointed unto all men once to die. And so they would all die and they'd have to be other priests. So Aaron was the first and all the descendants of Aaron thereafter down to the time uh, that the law ended. Then in Hebrews 7, 24, watch what we have under the gospel system. But this man, speaking of Jesus Christ, because he continueth ever hath an unchangeable priesthood. Thus, if Christ of the tribe of Judah, according to the flesh among the Jews, as he will reason in the book of Hebrews, is the high priest, there must have been changing the law of Moses because nobody but a descendant of Aaron of the Levitical or of the tribe of Levi could be a priest then. But Christ is priest now, eternal in the heavens. Thus the law had to be changed. Notice too, for if the first covenant, Hebrews 8, 7, for if the first covenant had been faultless, that is, it could do all that was needful to save a man from sin, and there'd be nothing less left to be done. If the first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. I could just simply ask this question. Is there a second covenant in the New Testament? Yes, there is. Therefore, the Old Testament could not have accomplished all God intended to accomplish for the ultimate good of man, his salvation in heaven, or you wouldn't have the New Testament. That's his reasoning. Then notice in Hebrews 8 verse 6, But now hath he, that's Jesus Christ, obtained a more excellent ministry, by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant, which was established upon better promises, now remember, James said, also a Jew who knew both sides of the matter, also inspired of the Holy Spirit as Peter and Paul and every other writer of the Bible. Notice that he says, this New Testament of the Christ, and this is never said of the old in the way it's said of the new, is the perfect law of liberty. That is, it's complete. That's the way the word perfect is used here. It doesn't mean in the sense it's good for everything that has to do with knowledge. It has to do with what it was given to accomplish. It's good for the spiritual aspect of man. It is the perfect law of liberty. And whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. But look at Hebrews 10 verse 9 and you'll see that the old was taken away. Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. Speaking of the Christ fulfilling his obligations to save man. He taketh away the first that he may establish a second. Could language be clearer? Then too, notice the new. How it's been established. Same book, Hebrews chapter 10 verse 9. He taketh away the first. Well, he did or he didn't. <laughs> he took it away. Why? That he may establish the second. Then too, notice this. We go back to Psalms. Listen to what the psalmist had to say in Psalm 105, verses 9 through 11. Unto thee will I give the land of Canaan the lot of your inheritance. What does that mean? While the Jew, according to the flesh, had his inheritance ultimately as not only a spiritual nation, but a civil nation, a fleshly nation in Canaan. Now that's why Canaan becomes a figure of, guess what, to us, of heaven. On Jordan's stormy banks I stand and cast a wishful eye to Canaan's fair and happy land where my possessions lie. Now you see, those songs mean nothing if you don't understand the scripture rightly divided on which they were based. Now listen to this. 1 Peter 1 and verse 4 the Christian, all men today who love the Lord, keep His commandments, sort of faithful unto death, Revelation 2.10, we have an eternal inheritance of which Canaan was not to the Jew. In 1 Peter 1 and verse 4, Peter says, To an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that fadeth not away. Listen, reserve, or reserve seat, there's a place reserved for folks. God's reserved it. It's heaven, reserved in heaven for you. The fellow said, you who? You Christians. Now look concerning the new or the old. In Ephesians 
Paul said this to the church in Ephesus in writing part of the New Testament of the Christ. Speaking of the law of Moses, he says, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, that means hate, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances. Why did he do it? We've seen in the book of Hebrews that it was taken away for the new. He said, for to make in himself of two, one new man, so making peace. That old middle wall of partition that separated Jew from Gentile was taken down. Now all men, regardless of ethnicity, whatever, they all approach God through the Christ. And it's back to what Christ said in John 14, 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but by me. Listen to Acts eleven twenty six, And the disciples were called Christians, first Antioch. Now, Isaiah had forecasted that a new name would be given. Remember, Isaiah is the great prophet who prophesied so uh, specifically about the Messiah and what the Messiah would accomplish. That is, salvation of all men when they believed and obeyed the gospel, God's power to save, Romans 1.16. Then this church and the specific individuals who make it up will have a new name given. Christian, meaning Christian of Christ. In Galatians 1, 13 through 23, and in that book, Paul's refuting the Judaizing teachers who said, yes, Christ is the Messiah. He is the Savior. But now you Gentiles will have to be circumcised to keep the law. And here's what uh, Paul said. For ye have heard of my conversation, that is, his conduct, his manner of life, in time past in the Jews' religion. How that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it. Then he goes on to say, But they heard only that he which persecuted us in times past now preacheth the faith which once he destroyed. Now why is that the case? Well, here again, that word faith stands for the whole system that is the New Testament system. And thus he preached the faith, he preached the gospel, he preached the word. It all means the same thing. Not what he once opposed, for he's been converted. He's seen the light of the gospel, and the gospel's converted him. So now he preaches the very thing he used to oppose. In Hebrews 8, 6 through 8, we go back to that book. List what he says about the new covenant. But now hath he obtained, speaking of the Christ, a more excellent ministry. By how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant which was established upon better promises. For if the first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. For finding fault with them, he saith, Now listen, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Then too, in Romans 8, 2, we find new law is discussed by Paul for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. Now the law of sin and death is this. Law violated death. But this law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus the gospel of Christ the power of God to save us Romans 1 16 hath made me free from that God's grace is extended to me as a lost person. And he shows me the terms of pardon. And when I accept that revelation, faith is formed in me. And I prove my faith, confidence, trust, and love of God and his system of salvation by humbly submitting to the truth of the gospel. And that's the way I receive the great things God's done for me that I never could do for myself. It's just simply the way we receive the salvation of God. There's a new mediator, Hebrews 12 and verse 24, unto Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant. I move along. There's a new and living way under the gospel system in Hebrews 10, 19 through 20. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. You remember that when Christ died on the cross, there is a, a was a veil in the temple separating the holy place from the most holy place wherein was kept the Ark of the Covenant 
where the high priest of the Levitical system went in once a year to sprinkle blood on the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant for himself and all the people. You remember what happened? That veil was rent from the top to the bottom. Don't you know the significance of it? Why, the Christ died. And that veil was removed for he, in his own person as the high priest, went once for all, offering his own blood before the throne of his Father. And thus we go back to his prayer in the garden. Father, glorify me with the glory I had with thee before the world was. In Revelation 1.5, listen to this. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth. In Hebrews 7.28, For the law maketh men high priests which have infirmity, but, but, but the word of the oath which was since the law maketh the Son who is consecrated forevermore. And then the last verse that we'll use in this sermon. Back to Peter in 1 Peter chapter 2, 5. He says to you and to me and to all Christians, ye, are, ye also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifice acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Old and new. Old and new. There are two parts of the Bible. You learn from the old, and you're saved by the new. Much in few words when you understand what they're based on, the enriching and glorious principles of the gospel of peace. If you're not a Christian, will you humbly receive with meekness the truth of the gospel and believing that Christ is the Son of God, repenting of your sins and confessing your faith in Him as the Son of God, completing your obedience to Him to become a Christian, by being immersed in water by the authority of Christ in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit to obtain the remission of your sins. As a child of God, have you let things slip? Has sin entered your life? Maybe it's been public. If so, we invite you at this time to come. Confessing those sins, we'll pray with you and for you. And in God's second law of salvation, He'll hear and forgive. Let us all who are accountable to God leave this building today, reconcile to Him, and faithful servants of the Most High. If you're subject to his invitation, then we invite you to come while we stand and while we sing.